All right, now, in Psalm chapter 20, Psalm 25 is a great psalm. I'm going to be focusing in kind of near the beginning there where, you know, David is, is basically praying this, this psalm unto God. And, you know, he starts off, Unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. Oh my God, I trust in thee. Let me not be ashamed. Let not mine enemies triumph over me. Yea, let none that wait on thee be ashamed. Let them be ashamed which transgress without cause. Show me thy ways. Verse number four. Show me thy ways, O Lord. Teach me thy paths. And this is the, the type of attitude that we all ought to have as Christians. You know, and this is why we come to church. And this is the type of church that, that I'm trying to, to help build here is people who love God and want to learn God's ways. He says, show me thy ways. Would to God we could all have this type of a heart where we would say, you know what? I just want to know what you want for me, God. I'm humble. I'm willing to do whatever it is that I need to do, whether it be difficult, whether it be easy, whether it be popular or unpopular. I just want to do what's right by you, God, with, with an honest heart and with the integrity of my heart. I want you to show me your ways. This is what this church is all about. Look at verse number five. Lead me in thy truth and teach me, for thou art the God of my salvation. On thee do I wait all the day. Now, what I'm going to be preaching on this morning is how we ought to love the truth. Just knowing what's, what is the truth. Now, some people, and I've, it's kind of bizarre. I've had conversations with some people where, you know, that don't believe in God or they don't believe the Bible. And when you try to have a discussion about what's right and what's wrong, they never have a good foundation of what's right and wrong. I mean, they can say that everybody's got an opinion. You could say all kinds of different things. And it's true. I mean, you could say, well, of course, you say, well, what about killing someone? Is that, is that wrong? Well, of course that's wrong. And, you know, obviously that's, that's a pretty obvious answer. But when you start trying to pin someone down and say, well, why? Especially when you ask people who don't believe in a God and say, well, we just evolved. Well, animals kill animals all the time. And if we're nothing more than just some animal, that's just kind of evolved and just, and just gotten smarter, right? And better than morally, why would it be wrong to take another person's life? If you don't have a God that's, that says this is right and this is wrong, right? I mean, you can say, well, we have a conscience, we have, which we do, but where did that conscience come from? I mean, did that just evolve? Why would that evolve? And even if, even if so, does that really make something absolutely right or absolutely wrong? Just because you have a, a feeling? Not, if there's no God, no. I mean, if there's no God, you can... What's to say that your opinion is any better than anybody else's? But see, what we believe, we believe there is a God. And we believe God's made the rules. And we believe God has commandments. And God says, this is wicked and this is good. And God's the one who defines these things. So it's no longer my opinion of what's right and wrong. It's God's word. I don't have to convince you that my thoughts or better on what's right and what's wrong because I'm just going to point to this book and say, here, this is where it says this is wickedness. This is where it says this is morally wrong. This is where it says this is right and this is good. It's not me who's saying it. And see, God's word is the truth. Now, you know, this goes back to even the formation of our church. Word of Truth Baptist Church was, was chosen as the name of this church for, for this very reason. is because I want this church to be a group of people who, who are honestly, open-mindedly and open-heartedly interested in just knowing the truth and loving the truth and following the truth, right? A lot of people will hear the truth and they get angry and they get mad. And they'll want to leave and they, won't want to, they don't want to have anything to do with you again. You know, we've had people come in, they, they've come and gone just over the, the brief year and a half that this church has been in existence. They'll come in, you know, they're looking for an independent fundamental Baptist church. They'll sit in for a couple services, then they hear something that offends them, and then they leave. Because their heart's not ready to hear the truth. And 
There's a lot of things in the Bible. If you think, oh, no, no, Pastor Burns, that's just you. You know, you're just, you're just mean and you're just, just picking on people, whatever. Look, Jesus Christ did nothing but preach the truth. And I'm not comparing myself to Jesus Christ. You know, I'm not saying that I'm somehow like as good as Jesus Christ or anything like that. But as we see even in this psalm, near the end of verse 25, he says, um, verse 19, Consider mine enemies, for they are many, and they hate me with cruel hatred. David had a lot of enemies that hated him. And just like anybody, when, when you are preaching the truth from God's word, you will be hated. The world will hate you. The world, look at what they did to Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ never spake, spake a lie. He never said anything untrue. He had the perfect temperament. He had the perfect things to say. I mean, everything he did was perfect. So whether he spake roughly to someone or whether he spake gently to someone, everything he did was the right way of doing it. And you can say, oh, no, no, you know, you could say things without getting people upset. Now, I, I agree with that to a point because there are ways of saying things where you can, you can try to, you know, you're not just trying to instigate a fight with somebody when you're telling them the truth. You're trying to do it in meekness and in love. But there's some things that you tell someone that there's no nice way of saying it. You just got to say it if it's the truth. You know, like, for example, a sinner that's going to hell. There's not a nice way of saying you are going to burn in fire and flames and torture and torment forever. And there is no rest from that. There's not a real nice way of saying that. It is, it's the truth, though. And people need to hear that truth. We can't just ignore it. You know, you may have family or friends or loved ones that are lost, that you know their faith isn't in Jesus Christ. But because you don't want there to be a conflict, because you don't want them to, to dislike you or even to hate you or whatever, you just talk about the weather. You talk about these other things. Well, if you truly love that person, you're going to tell them the truth. Amen. People need to hear that truth. Now, whether they can handle it or not, that's up to them. And that's how I operate this church. You know, when people come in, I'm not going to bend over backwards and change the preaching and change the Bible and not preach on certain things because I don't want anybody to leave. No, on the contrary. I want the people who stay, who love the truth, and who come here interested and just say, you know what, let's read the Bible. Let's look in the Bible. Let's see what God's Word has to say about all these various subjects that we deal with on a daily basis in our life. Let's see what God's Word has to say from that and what is the truth. Now, I may not be absolutely right 100% of the time. I'm not claiming to be. I'm not perfect. But my goal should be the same as your goal of wanting to, to, to come to the truth. And that's also why when I preach, you'll notice how many scriptures we do go to. Because I'm trying to prove a point. I'm trying to prove my case and say, here's what I believe. And I'm going to show you why. It's not just some unfounded thing that's just popped into my head. Say, hey. I think that God's word says this, and I'm just going to believe that. No, it comes from evidence. It comes from support. It comes from the scripture. The Bible says in Proverbs 23, 23, you don't have to turn, turn if you would to Ephesians chapter 6. In the New Testament, Ephesians chapter 6. We ought to have a high value on learning and knowing the truth. Proverbs 23, 23 says, buy the truth and sell it not. Also, wisdom and instruction and understanding. So he's saying the truth is something you ought to be willing to spend, to spend money on. This is something that you ought to value to where you're going to, whatever it takes, you know, whatever the cost, I'm going to get to the truth. I want to know the truth. But he says, don't sell it. The truth is, and, and, and this is exactly why everything, all the materials, all the resources, you know, there's no admission price to come into this building. There's, you know, when we go out, we don't charge people before we give them the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you want a DVD, if you want a Bible, if you want any type of resource, informational resource, it's free. Because we're not here to sell the truth. We're here to get the message out to as many people as possible. Now again, many people get offended and I didn't quite finish my point with Jesus Christ. They crucified him. They spit on him. They beat him up. And this is a man that did no wrong, did no evil to anybody, didn't hurt anybody. He had a voice. And on the contrary, he healed people. He helped people. 
Yet because of the things that he said, because the truth hurts people sometimes, they don't want to hear it. It makes people angry. And usually it's because when you speak the truth, it's this big spotlight. It's light. It's brightness. It's good. And if you are a person that's filled with darkness and wickedness and evil, you don't want that light shined on you. Now, we ought to. We ought to want that light shined on us. If we have the right heart inside of us, you're going to want to say, I know I have some wickedness inside of me. I want that light shined on there because I want it all eliminated. I want it gone. I want to be pure. I want to be right in God's eyes. As opposed to the attitude that says, get that thing off me. I want to, I want to dwell in the darkness like a cockroach that scatters and runs every time you turn a light on and they go and try to hide and get in the dark places. That's what the, the cockroaches do. We ought not to be like a cockroach. But some people, some people are like that. And that, those are the same people that killed our Lord Jesus Christ because he rebuked the world of sin. He spake the truth and he spake the truth in love, but they hated him so much because he spake the truth. That is the reason for, you know, for them, for them killing him is because if he wasn't preaching, why would they kill him? Why would they be so angry that he was healing people and helping people out? No, it was his voice. It was the words that he was saying and it is all truth. And if you stand on the truth today and, and preach the truth and say you believe the truth, you'll be hated too. We're not any better than Jesus Christ. In fact, we're worse. There's, there's more reasons for people to hate us because we're sinners. Because we're not perfect. Because we do do wrong people sometimes. Because we're imperfect. Jesus Christ was perfect. He had none of that. And they hated and killed him. How much more is the world going to hate us? If you're preaching the truth. If you're sticking to that. I mean, we're not better than Christ. We, can ex we can't expect any less. You're in Ephesians chapter 6. Because our battle is a spiritual battle. It's not a physical battle. You know, we, we, I preach on, excuse me, I preach on sin a lot. I'll preach on, on different wickedness, different types of people, groups of people who, who are living, uh, you know, this a horrible life or whatever and, um, and are doing abominations against God. But never will you hear me say we're going to now take up arms and like go fight these people because they're really wicked. That's not, that's not the message. Okay, and that's not what we're all about. We are in a battle, yes. We need armor. We need a weapon. We need a sword. But it's all a spiritual battle. We're going to see that in Ephesians chapter 6. Look at verse number 11 of Ephesians chapter 6. Verse 11, the Bible reads, Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that ye may, may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Now, our enemy is basically the devil, but there's, you know, there's spiritual wickedness, it says here, in high places. That's why the governments of the world are so corrupt. These people that, that are in these positions of power in general, by and large, I would say probably 99.9% .9 of them, because I'm not going to speak for every single one, single individual, but at least at the highest levels, they're wickedness. And there's spiritual wickedness in these high places, and they are the rulers of the darkness of this world. They don't want the light shined on them. <coughs> and you think about it, there's a lot of the, the rulers of the time in Jesus' day as well. The, the Pharisees and the, the, the governors and the rulers at that time, they were p people of, of power that were conspiring to have Jesus killed. And it's no different today. But see, we need to, to be able to, to raise up our voices to shine the light on the wickedness. And look at what it says in verse 14, part of the armor that we need in order to stand against the wiles of the devil, in order to fight against these powers, in order to wrestle against this, this spiritual wickedness in high places. Verse 14, stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness. It goes on and on about the rest of the armor. We're preaching about the truth this morning. The truth is critical for fighting against the spiritual wickedness. 
We need what's true and what's right. We need to know what's true and what's right. And we need to, to stand firm on it and proclaim it from the housetops. <coughs> we are not to be ignorant also, though, of the devil's devices. See, Satan's going to try to convince you that evil is good and that good is evil. That's why we need to know the truth, because he's going to be out there trying to distort the truth. The devil is, is a father of lies. He says he's a liar from the beginning and the father of it. And if it's a lie, obviously it's not the truth because they're completely polar opposites. You either have something that's correct and true or something that's a lie. In second, you don't have to turn it. Turn if you will. You're in Ephesians 6. Just flip back to Ephesians chapter 4. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10, the Bible says, To whom ye forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgave anything, to whom I forgave it for your sakes, forgave I it in the person of Christ, lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. We're not ignorant of the things, or we shouldn't be. We should be wise to the tactics that Satan uses, to, to, the, to the attacks that he's going to come with in order for us to be prepared. We're, you know, we're not ignorant of the way that he operates. We know he's a liar. We know he's a deceiver. We know that, that he's going to take sin and try to make it look really attractive to you. All the more reason why you need to be on guard with, with everything, with the, with the information that comes at you on a daily basis, whether it be from a billboard sign, whether it be from a TV, a radio, a newspaper, or another person talking to you. You receive lots of information on a daily basis. We need to be able to filter that information and determine what is true and what is right. And unfortunately today, I mean, we need the media. Like, I like following the news and kind of knowing what's going on in the world. But you want to talk about a, a source of lies and misinformation and deception? Yeah, look at any of the mainstream media. And really, you know, any news in general, for any person to say that this is unbiased news, it's false. Every person has a bias when you present the news. I have a bias. I have a bias when I'm, when I'm preaching today because I believe that the Bible is true. This is my bias. If something strikes me as newsworthy, why does it strike me as newsworthy? It's because of my worldview, because of my view on, every, on thing, the way things are versus something that I don't think is a big deal at all, that it's not newsworthy. So even just determining what to say is a newsworthy, is having a bias. Now, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with having a bias on, uh, based on the things that you believe. But this go, the, the, the mainstream media goes well beyond that. They're involved in distorting and twisting things to tell you the narrative that they want to tell you. And we need to be aware of this too because this is how people get deceived into doing things. This is how wars are fought. The propaganda and the information that's given to you is designed to, to instill an emotion within you and a justification for doing something. So what, every time that, this, that the United States is going to try to get into war, look at, look at what the media does and look at what they, what they report on. It's all, and knowing first, I've been involved in, in stupid small cases, just local things with the news. Where I've literally been an eyewitness and have seen and heard everything that happened and then going and reading a news report of the events later that day. It's incredible what they can do with bits and pieces of information that aren't necessarily incorrect in themselves to put it together to present an image of what happened that is completely false completely false and just the the words the adjectives the descriptions to 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 sway people one way or another to be for something or against something not telling a full story i have seen this firsthand and it's it's insane the power that is wielded by people who have an audience by providing information you know whether it be Fox or CNN or MSNBC or I don't care who it is. They all lie. None of them are going to tell you the truth. So you need to be aware of this when you listen to these reports and hear about these things because you have to be very careful with the information coming in in order for you to know what's true. Now, ultimately, you know, the Bible says let every man be true be be a, uh, let God be true but every man a liar. And that's true. We know that God's word is true. 
We don't have to question God's word. Question everything else. Do not question God's word. God's word is the truth. We know that we're settled on this. This is a fact. This is truth. But um, you're in Ephesians chapter 4. Kind of went off a little bit on a rabbit trail there, but you know, as I mentioned before, Satan, we're not ignorant of Satan's devices. He's going to try to convince you that evil is good, good's evil. He's very good at the art of deception. And he'll use things like the mainstream mirror or whatever to, to get you to, to believe in a lie and to believe in an untruth. Um, he, he uses false prophets also, and this is why it's extremely important when you're choosing a church or going to a church to attend, that you're attending a church that's going to preach the truth unto you. So the more Bible that's being read and taught within the service is going to be probably better. Now you got to start off with someone who's got the right Bible. I mean, it only makes sense. Right? If you want the truth, well, you can't. You, the truth isn't found in books that say different things. It's just not. You got two books that say two different things. They can't both be right. They're not both going to be the truth. And um, that's why. You know, I mean, this service, this sermon isn't about the King James Bible and the inspired Word of God. But the King James Bible is the inspired Word of God. It is. God's word preserved for us today in 2015. So as you go to church, you go, know, hey, make sure that they, they have the truth, the word of God. There is not multiple words of God. There is the word of God. And we have in the King James Bible in the English speaking language today. But also make sure that, you know, they're not just pulling out one verse and then the rest of the time they're just talking. How do you really know what they're saying is true? I mean, they're, they're, not, they're not backing up what they're saying. They're not really giving you the truth of the matter. And they, they may, maybe they are saying what's true. But we want to we be solid and sure in what we believe, which is only going to come from Scripture and from God's Word. You're in Ephesians 4. We're going to see how Satan uses false prophets and false teachers also. To, to lie and wait and deceive. And this is why church is, is also very important. Ephesians 4.11 says, And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. God has given us teachers. He's given us people whereby we can help understand and learn the Bible from. But, but keep reading here. Verse number 13 says, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. So here it's saying, you know, we don't want to be, the reason why we listen to the evangelists and the teachers, because we don't want to be children just tossed to and fro. Like every time you hear something, oh, hey, that sounds good, and, and you just believe that. And, and everything that you hear, just, you just hear some new doctrine, and you're just clinging to that and saying, oh, yeah, you know, that, that sounds good. I like that. I'm going to believe that too. Because this is what people do. There are a lot of people out there that says here they're, they have cunning craftiness. They're good at this. They're real crafty about it. They're real slick about it. And it's, they're designing this where they lie in wait to deceive you. Lying in wait means that they're, they're hiding and trying to trap you and they're ready to trick you with false doctrine, <laughs> with false beliefs. They're trying to, to, to snare you and trap you into a, into a false belief. That's why God gave us pastors and teachers, but that's also why we need to make sure that they're teaching and preaching the truth, that they're not one of these, these cunning, crafty men. You know, that's why you look at like the, the Joel Osteens of the world. How often is he really going to Scripture? Now, he'll say this positive message, and he'll say a lot of things that, that might sound good, but we need to be grounded and founded in the truth. My friends, Joel Osteen is only interested in getting the money. The guy is a multimillionaire, and he never, ever preaches on sin. He never preaches on, you know, what we need to do to change our lives and to, and to walk in what's right. He just, he just preaches a feel-good message. Look, a feel-good message all the time. You're not going to get anyone hating you. Jesus Christ said, you know, 
um, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. But he also said, um, woe unto you when men speak highly of you, when, when all men... Um, Oh, I don't have the reference now. Sorry, my brain is kind of mush right now. He says, Woe unto you when, when men shall speak highly of you. Basically, when, when everybody is... <laughs> when everybody is, is just praising you, when the world is praising you, when you're able to go on TV and nobody's mad at you, no one's angry with you, He's saying, woe unto you. He said, for so did they the false prophets which were before you. When the whole world loves you, then you've got a problem. Because, oh, is this in this, no, this sermon or not? I've got another sermon. Let's turn, if you would, to 1 John. I don't want to. I don't want to leave this point like this. I, I want to prove everything I'm saying here, just so you understand where I'm coming from. Um, I'm getting there. First John. Oh wait, you know what? No, that's, there's a reference in there. I'm 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 thinking of Excuse me for a minute. Oh, 1 John chapter 2. This isn't quite what I was looking for, but this is one of the references. The Bible says in verse 15, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. Um, that's not the scripture that I was looking for, though. Well, let's move on here. I, I'll... I'll I'll have to get the, the references later. I'll preach, I'll preach on this again next week on, what, on, on the, the, the false prophets that are lying in wait to deceive because um, my mind is just completely shut down as far as finding the references for that. So I apologize for that. But um, we need to basically you know, be looking at the Bible as our source of truth, as our source of information. You know, a lot of people are saying a lot of good things, or things that sound good. They sound real pleasing. They sound pleasant. But are they true? We need to be able to stack everything up against, is that what the Bible really teaches? Is that what the Bible really says? And are you going to be listening to someone who is just trying to tickle your ears and say things that, that just make you feel good and sound good, would you rather just have that all the time? Or would you rather have someone be able to just expose the truth to you and lay it bare and just say, hey, you know, you're wrong about this. You need to get this right. Now, no one likes to be told that they're wrong. That's why, you know, you have guys like Joel Osteen, he never says 
people do anything wrong. You're doing great, keep doing what you're doing, everything's great, everything's fine, everything's dandy. But is anybody here doing everything right? Because I know I'm not. We all, and, and how will you ever improve? How are you ever gonna improve? Think about this, and no matter what you're doing, how are you ever gonna be improve if all you ever hear is everything you're doing is just great, keep doing what you're doing? How will you ever do better? It's not gonna happen. You're gonna need to find out about the areas where you are lacking. The areas where you need to, to work on and you need to fix and you need to do better on. And in many cases, that's sin in our life or it could be something else that we need to be challenged to do that's gonna, gonna you know, make us do more for God. And both are important. Getting the sin out of our life is extremely important because God's not gonna be able to use you very much if you are just living a, a, a very wicked, sinful life. But um, turn if you would to um, turn if you would to the book of Proverbs, Proverbs twenty two. Because part of receiving wisdom and part of hearing the truth is going to require us to be humble. We need to be ready to receive, and this is kind of how I started off with the sermon: is that. We need to be coming in here ready to hear and ready to receive the truth, whatever that may be. Um, the book of Proverbs, right after the book of Psalms, right if you open up your Bible in the middle, you have the book of Psalms, and then you have the book of Proverbs. Right after the book of Psalms. And we're going to look at Proverbs chapter 22. Proverbs 22, verse 17 says, bow down thine ear. That means lower, you're going to have to lower yourself, lower your ear, right? Bow down your ear and hear the words of the wise and apply thine heart unto my knowledge. So the bowing down of your ear is, is a humbling of yourself, is a lowering of yourself, right? To hear the words of the wise. And you need to apply your heart, is what it's saying, unto knowledge. We need to get our heart ready. We need to have our, our, our head our minds and our hearts humbled where we're not thinking that we're so great, right? That everything I'm doing is, is just perfect. Man, I'm spot on. I am doing so great. God, I'm like God's favorite son. Humble. Humility. Where we're saying, you know what? I, I know I'm not right, God. I need you to help me. I need some correction. I want you to show me what's true and what's right. That's the heart we need to have in order to receive wisdom, in order to hear the words of the wise. Turn back, if you would, to chapter 9, Proverbs 9. Because we also need to be able to receive correction or taking rebuke. Someone telling you that you are wrong. Because again, your, your, your initial reaction is going to be, to get defensive about it. Now, I'm not wrong. I'm just fine. No, you're wrong. Right? But when it comes to God's word, if what's being said is the truth, if we're reading the Bible, if we're looking at God's word, and that's what this is what's true, we need to be able to receive the correction from his word if you're doing something that the Bible says you shouldn't be doing. It's bottom line. It's the most simple way I could say it. Look at uh, verse 8 of chapter 9. The Bible says, Reprove not. Reprove just means you're telling someone that they're wrong. You're proving that they're wrong. Reprove not a scorner, lest he hate thee. Rebuke a wise man, and he will love thee. Give instruction to a wise man, and he will be yet wiser. Teach a just man, and he will increase in learning. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And the knowledge of the holy is understanding. So this is saying, if you, if you are wise, if you're smart, if you, if you have any type of smarts to you at all, when someone rebukes you in truth from the Bible, you're going to love that person. You ought to love that person. Not hate them, not get mad at them, not get angry with them, but love them for loving you enough to say, hey, I know this isn't, gonna, this isn't the best Subject. This isn't the best news, but look, you know, you, there's a problem here, and we need to fix it. And 
this is this is part of my job. Hopefully, I'm doing a good job. Hopefully, I mean, you people here are listening to this. I expound on God's word and on His truth. You know, and for future reference, when you come in here, there may be something that I preach on that deals directly with you, like to a T. You know, and usually I don't even know about it. Okay, but the reaction that you have is gonna is gonna make all the difference in the world on whether or not you get right. I mean, it's a, you can get angry, you can get upset, but what are you upset at, right? If, if I'm doing my job correctly and I'm preaching the truth and you hear something, you can go ahead and get mad at me, you can leave. I mean, people have in the past. They, they, they'll get mad, they'll leave, and they won't come back. All based on the things that are coming out of my mouth. But it's, um, you know, if it's the truth, your heart needs to be right in order to say, you know what, I want to know what's right. I want to know how I can change, how I can do things better. What do I need to get out of my life so that I can live a life that truly is in line with God's word and with the truth? Um, turn, if you would, to 2 Timothy chapter 2. If you really do have a love for the truth, then you will be reading your Bible every day because you need to be able to examine what I'm saying, whether it's true or not. Now, I'm using a lot of scripture to try to prove this to you, but you also need to be educated for yourself to make sure that, you know, in the context of how I'm using these verses, that, they, that it's correct, that it's true. Because oftentimes I'm going, I'm only reading one verse here, two verses here, three verses there, whatever. You know, whatever, whatever portion of scripture is 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 necessary so that we're not just reading the whole Bible cover to cover, right? We're, 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 we're jumping around a little bit and picking out these, these parts of the Bible that, ha that deal with this subject. But you need to know that I'm not just yanking something out that's, that's not really what that verse is talking about at all, right? Because people do that. And that's another way that people deceive. And, and, the, and they get all kinds of weird false doctrines because the majority of people don't know their Bible. The majority of people don't ever read their Bible. Majority of people have never read the Bible cover to cover even one time. That's the majority of people. But I want this church to not be the majority of people. I want this church to be something special. I want this church to be full of people who know their Bible, who love God, who want to know the truth, and, and are really zealous about doing what's right. And part of that's going to come down to you taking the time in your time at home and reading your Bible to know for yourself what is true. You get a lot of learning that way. It's not all just coming to church and learning. It's, it's Most of it should be you going home and learning and reading the Bible on your own. Um, I know I have you in 2 Timothy chapter 2, but in John chapter 17, verse 16, the Bible reads, They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Jesus Christ speaking and referring to his disciples, he says, Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word, is truth. He's talking about God's word is truth. And it sanctifies us. It sets us apart. It makes us more holy. It, 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 it All of this comes through God's word. That's why God's word is so important. Sit up straight. But in 2 Timothy chapter 2, the Bible says in verse 15, study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. We need, you know, the Bible saying right here, you need to study to show yourself approved unto God. You are, are needing approval. And look, it's not to the pastor, it's not to the fellow church members, it's not so that other people can hear you and say, oh man, that guy's really smart and he knows his Bible. It says, study to show thyself approved unto God. So whatever standard you think that is for your life, what do you think God said? And I'm not going to lay it out for you. You determine what that is. What do you think God expects of you? How much truth do you think God wants you getting on a daily basis? If you were to go to God and, and say, here's what I'm doing, God. Do you approve of this? Make it up for yourself. How much do you think you ought to be spending time listening to him? Because when you read the Bible, you're listening to God. If you're going to go to God and say, God, I just want you to approve of me. But you were, for example, you were to say, but I spend two minutes listening to you a day. 
two minutes. I pick up my Bible, I open it up to, to the book of Proverbs, I read a verse, and then I close it. Do you think God would say, yes, that, I, that I'm happy with that, I approve, or not? I mean, and again, this isn't something, because the Bible doesn't say you have to read X amount of chapters or this amount, you know, it doesn't say that. This is something that we need to make sure in, in your, for yourself that you are studying to show yourself approved unto God. God's going to make that, you, you know, whatever you think God's standard would be for you is what you ought to be living up to. It's important to studying and knowing God's word, knowing the truth. Hey, knowing the truth is going to help you in making the decisions in your life. That's why, we got, you know, that's why I preach the Bible so much. We preach, on, say we preach on all kinds of different things so that you can have this knowledge and take the knowledge with you because if you know what's right and true, man, making decisions becomes so much easier. Most of the times we struggle when we make decisions, what's the right decision? What's the right thing to do? Well, you're going to be struggling a lot more if you're not getting the truth in you, if you're not staying and reading God's Word on a regular basis. That's going to be a much difficult struggle for you than if you say, well, wait, I remember reading this in the Bible. I remember reading about this. And, well, it looks like this is the right, the right way to go. It may not be the way I wanted to go, but it's the right way. And you can know what's right when you study for yourself. We ought to be like the Bereans were. In Acts chapter 17, it uh, talks about, you know, the Apostle Paul and Silas, they were going around, they were preaching the gospel, to, and they were, they were evangelizing all kinds of different people, going into foreign countries, different areas. They were preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. They were, and, and not only that, I mean, they were winning souls, but churches were getting formed. Churches were getting started, and, and they're helping them get, get grounded and founded in the truth and preaching God's word. And it says in verse 10 of Acts 17, And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. So they go into the, they go into the synagogue, right? And they start preaching the truth unto them. And it says in verse 11, These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind, and search the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. Therefore, many of them believed. Also of honorable men, uh, women, which were Greeks, and of men, not a few. The result of them being noble. The result of them, you know, they were able to receive the word because their mind was ready. They were ready to hear the truth. They were ready to, 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 to listen to somebody and examine whether or not what they were saying is true because then they searched the scriptures. It says they searched the scriptures daily. They were being taught. They would go into the synagogue. Apostle Paul would be up and he'd be preaching and teaching them about Jesus Christ and about you know, all these different things that he would preach on. And they would go home and say, okay, you know, they, they, their mind was ready to receive it. They'd come in and hear it. And then they'd go, is, what, is that really true? Now what he references scriptures, is that really true? Is that really what this is saying? And they'd examine it and study it and say, yeah. He's, he's preaching the truth. This is what the scripture actually says. This is how we ought to be. Now, does that require some effort and work? Of course it does. But do you want to be the type of person who's just spoon-fed everything that you believe from someone else? Just saying, here you go. This is what's true. Here you go. This is what's true. Unfortunately, there's way too many people that are like that today, and they're just willing to trust someone else with what they believe to be true in a fact. You need to, to be able to know for yourself what's true and what's right. Now, it doesn't mean don't listen to anybody. We learn a lot from teachers. We learn a lot from other people who study things out. Yes. But examine what's said if, it's, if it does actually line up and you're not being deceived. Do enough of the research necessary to verify what you're hearing to be true. One last point, and I'm going to get into this more tonight, is um, you know, as we, we learn more about the Bible, as we learn more of the truth, there's a tendency in people 
to get prideful and arrogant. I've seen it happen. It usually happens with younger Christians, with younger spiritually and in just your age-wise. I've noticed this more in my experience in church that it's typically a younger generation as well as people who are newer Christians, newer saved, that they'll get in a good church or they'll hear some really good teaching and preaching and they'll learn a lot of stuff that a lot of other people don't really know. Right? But it's real simple. Like when, when you go through it and, and you actually hear it taught and hear it preached, it's basic stuff. But, it's, but it, a lot of people may not believe that or they don't know that. And when you are in a position where you know something a lot of other people don't know, it has a tendency for people to get arrogant and get prideful because you think you're so smart and all these other people are so stupid because how could you not know X, Y, and Z? How, how can you possibly not know that? When they didn't know it like six months ago, <laughs> right? But, but this is, this is the, the, the pride and the arrogance that comes up. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 8, 1, Now as touching things offered unto idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. Knowledge can get you puffed up. Just knowing a lot more things, knowing more than everybody else does. History, you'll, you oftentimes will see people who are real smart, right? Even just in this world, I'm talking about worldly speaking, right? People who are these really brainiacs, these really smart people, have a tendency to be jerks and proud and arrogant. And that's true because they look at everyone else like you're an idiot because I have so much knowledge. And, and, you know, I talk to people out going soul winning and the people who are like, well, I've got a bachelor's in divinity and I've got this, you know, and, and I've got all these degrees. They're proud. They have to tell you. Instead of, instead of having a conversation about the scripture and showing what you really know, it always goes to the wall. I have this degree and I have that degree and I, you know, and I, and I can, do, you know, I don't care. I don't. It doesn't matter to me. What, you know, let's talk the truth. But um, just be aware of that, you know, that, that as you learn more and as you grow, not to get puffed up in your own knowledge and in, in, your, in your understanding of Scripture and, or of other things. Um, it's something we need to be aware of. But I'm going to be preaching more about pride tonight. Um, my last points here, I'm going to, we need to be able to, to challenge our own beliefs. Okay? Even if, and especially if, they've been held for a very long time. We ought to be able to have the readiness of mind to be able to examine things that we believe on a regular basis. Or, you know, I mean, there's some things that you can get grounded and founded and settled on, like Jesus Christ died for our sins. I mean, you know that to be true. That should be foundational. That's at the, the source that you don't have to question that anymore. That's, it's settled. It's done. You believe it. It's, it's true, right? And as you, you learn some of these basic truths, you don't have to continue to be revisiting them. But I guess more what I'm saying is maybe you'll hear something that someone says that will challenge what you've always thought to be true. Okay? And this can be difficult. And the older we get, I think the difficult it can be. But we need to make sure, like in Proverbs 18, 13, the Bible says, He that answereth a matter before he heareth it, it is folly and shame unto him. We shouldn't be so quick to answer something without hearing everything. So sometimes, you know, when I'm preaching a sermon... If you hear something in the beginning and you're just like, oh man, that, you know, you get like upset or angry, so wait, hear the whole thing. Or you start saying, well, that, that's not true, that can't be right. Listen to the whole thing. Listen to all of the evidence that support it. And then right, make your decision. And then say, well, wait a minute, yeah, I know I believe this for a really long time, but um, that's actually not true because I've seen enough evidence now to be able to change my mind about it and receive what's true. Um, Now, I'm, I'm going to illustrate this point that I'm making. 
sorry, I was just reading through my notes and I, I just said everything in a completely different way, but it's the same exact point. I'm going to illustrate what I'm talking about as far as hearing things that maybe you've, you've accepted to be true for a long time, but um, when you hear something that's different, uh, and we're, the, the, the goal of this exercise I'm going to do right now is for you to gauge your own response. I'm going to say some things. First of all, I'm going to say some things that have nothing to do with the Bible. Okay? Just, just, just worldly things, things like historical facts or whatever, or a challenge to an historical fact. And I want you just to pay attention to, one, your emotions and your willingness to hear evidence as I make these statements. It'll start off kind of easy and then maybe, you know, just, and, and I'm not going to go through and prove any of this stuff today, but, I, but the, the point is just, if, I, if I'm going to make a statement, what's going to be your reaction? Are you going to be you know, willing to hear or not? So, first thing would be abortion is murder. Now, you can see how, and probably everyone here would be in agreement with that, but that's, a, that's something that you can make a statement on, and all of a sudden people get very upset. Maybe there would be someone sitting here who's had an abortion. And they're going to be, it's going to convict them, they're going to be real guilty. And they don't want to believe that that's true. You can see why you would not want to believe something like that is true, especially if you've done something like that before. Now, maybe you've done it in ignorance, maybe, you know, whatever. doesn't matter. But, but if it's, and especially when something applies to you, you can say, well, wait, you know, like, we can't be so quick to, to turn off our ears and to stop listening because something maybe offends you or you know, it, it rubs, you know, something, you hear something like, whoa, that catches you off guard, maybe. That one is a little bit easier, but how about this? What if you were to say, the Holocaust never happened? There's people that believe that. What about, what about this? That, you know, when, when the trade towers fell, 9-11, it was actually designed by people within our own government. Or how about this? Our US, the United States had intelligence of the Pearl Harbor attack and even allowed it to happen and allowed people all to lose their lives in order to get us into the war. Now, or how about this? Man has never walked on the moon. Okay, now some of these things, they might be silly, they might be, you know, uh, and especially with the war stuff where people are dying and losing their life, okay, that can hit home really close to a lot of people, people who have been involved in these events. But what, and, and, and all of those things I mentioned, they're not, they're not the, the, the common story that you're told. It's not the, the, the modern narrative, right? That's, you're, you're taught completely different on everything that I mentioned. The, the, the official stories go against every single one of those things. And um, I'm not going to go into detail on any of them because it doesn't matter. The point was to be able to see how do you respond when, when you hear something that may sound off the wall crazy or, or just something that might be offensive or something that might be, you know, would you be willing, would you at least be willing to hear evidence to support those claims and make your decision? Because that, that, this, this is the type of attitude that we ought to have if we want to know the truth about something, not just to, to clam up and be like, no, this is really uncomfortable because I believe this way for a really long time and there's no way that that could possibly be true because if that's true, then that means all these people are lying to me. And all Deal with the consequences after the fact, but first, you, you know, because people get, get so concerned about, well, if that were to be true, then blah, 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 blah. Well, wait. Don't judge something on whether or not it's true based on what it means if it's true. If that makes sense. Like, the implications of something being true, yeah, there's a lot of other implications. So some of these things I said, there's a lot of implications involved with those things. But first we need to determine, is it true? Is it valid? Are those statements, are any of them even valid at all? What are the, what are the, the evidence to support um, any of those things? Now, none of those issues are biblical issues, except maybe you know, the abortion can be looked at as a biblical issue, of course, because that's where we could determine where life is from. But now what's going to happen when it's biblical doctrine, right? What if I were to say the Jews are not God's chosen people? That's something that gets a lot of people upset. Or the pre-tribulation rapture is a lie. It's not true. 
if I were to make a statement like that, would you be willing to hear out the evidence and the support, or are you just going to shut down and be like, nope, I was taught this. I mean, there are people who have been taught from a child in the pre-tribulation rapture. That it's true, that it's coming, you know, God's going to come at any moment, Jesus Christ is going to come back, we, you know, and, and, and you hear it, and you hear it, and you hear it, and it gets pounded in your head. Certain things get pounded in your head over and over and over again. But are you, is your mind ready and willing to listen to evidence and to challenge long-standing beliefs? I'll give you a personal example. I'm going to close with this. I'll give you a personal example of myself. Before I got saved, and even after I say, I've always been a big science guy. I love science. I love math. I love science. I've always been good at it. Those are the things that interest me. I used to think, because of the way I was taught, that if a person did not believe that evolution was true, that they were an idiot. That they were unintelligent, they did not know anything, that I could not believe that anyone would think that way. They must just be stupid. At this day and age, with everything that we know, to not believe that evolution is true. Well, I'll tell you what happened. I got saved. I put my faith in Jesus Christ. But right after that, because I wasn't, I wasn't a total idiot either, I mean, not a total idiot. Now, I was kind of stupid for believing in evolution. But I knew immediately there was a problem. I knew that Jesus Christ paid for my sins more than I knew evolution was true. But that's why I put my faith in Christ. Some people tend to want to cling to things like evolution and say, no, the Bible can't be true. Jesus, you know, this whole thing can't be true because evolution is true. I mean, people have that type of mentality, and it's sad. But when I put my faith in Christ to save my soul, I knew right away, like the very next day, well, wait a minute, now I have a problem because now there's a contradiction. Because I knew that the Bible taught in creation. I knew the Bible taught in God created the heavens and the earth and, and there's six days that God made everything. That is not what evolution teaches at all. There is something that needs to be reconciled there. But that's when I decided to search out the matter and research it. And guess what? I learned that there are so many facts and scientific evidence that was never presented the whole time I was growing up in public school and learning from the textbooks they never brought up all of the reasons to doubt and all the reasons that prove their assumptions and their assertions to be false and that show the junk science that's used to support evolution it's garbage it's nonsense but they don't tell you that side of the story they just tell you what they want. It's like the media. They'll tell you information in little bits and pieces and they'll, they'll, they'll inflate it, the, the reliability of it, to be like, well, this is fact because it's science. And don't look into it very deep. Just trust us. This is science. There's people with a lot of letters after their names that say that this is true. You need to trust that person because they're a lot smarter than you. This is the attitude. This is the way it's spun. We need to be smarter than that. And say, you know what? No, I'm going to look it up for myself. I'm going to, you know, and especially if it's something you care about. For me, that, I did care about that. I found a mountain of information that I didn't even know existed for my first 20 years of life. Didn't even know about it. Never once was it, was it brought to me as saying, hey, did you ever even consider this? And even today, in today's schools, children aren't being taught to question things like they once were. You're taught, this is true and you believe it, and that's it. And you don't, you don't question things. I was a very good student because I didn't question anything that I was taught. I just soaked it up and ate it up as if it was all true. So I got a lot of good grades. I got a lot of A's because I was able to repeat the things that I was, that I was taught. But it takes, it, it takes effort and you have to be aware and constantly be thinking about challenging the things that you hear and be able just, just to say, is this true? Is this right? And a lot of the things I mentioned aren't really that important as far as the non-biblical things, right? I mean, whatever. I, I threw them in there. 
Now, if you're really interested, I believe every single one of those things that I mentioned, that my, those, are, those are statements that I would stand by, but it doesn't matter. These things, this is not what I'm here to, to preach. I'm here to preach the Bible and the truth. Those things, those are my beliefs based on evidence that I've seen, but it's amazing how many things that you can receive and hold to be true for so long. And not even realize that there's so much other information out there because you've just kind of bought into whatever has been, has been presented to you. And we need to just be aware of this. And if you love the truth, the implications aren't going to matter as much as just, at, at first, as just getting to the bottom of it, knowing, is this right? Is this true? So when we go through biblical truths, pre-tribulation rapture, is that true? Well, let's look at Scripture. Let's hear what people have to say. Let's hear what, what, what someone who doesn't believe that's true has to say about that. Let me see the Scripture. What, where are you coming from? Show me the proof from the Bible. This is the attitude we all ought to have. Show me the proof of that. And I'm willing to engage people in conversation on a lot of these things that I believe and just say, well, well, tell me why. And then we do this all the time. We go soul winning. Why do you think you're going to heaven? What's your, what, what, what do you, what's your evidence? What do you believe about that? Is it just a thought in your heart or is, it, or is there some basis to that? And if the basis is in the Bible, you know, some people say, well, you need to be baptized. We say, well, let's look at the evidence for that. You know, all the different doctrines, all the different things you need to do. Let's look at the evidence. Let's study it. Let's look at it and, and determine what's right based on hearing it all. And, you know, the Bible said, Jesus Christ said, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. I emphasize the truth because ultimately the truth will make us free, especially the free from the bondage of sin. We need to know the truth about what's right and what's wrong so that we cannot get involved in the bondage of sin. We can be free from that sin in knowing the truth. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your words, the words of truth, dear Lord, that we have today that you preserved for us. God, I pray that you would please just um, help us all to continue to, to gain knowledge and wisdom and to learn the truth about all matters, dear God. Help us to be skeptical just in general about, about the things that we hear and what we're willing to, to receive as fact and willing to believe, dear God. Um, Obviously, we, need, we only have so many hours in the day to, to, to challenge things and to study things out. So help us not to get too distracted with some of these other things that are going on politically or in the world that can really eat up a lot of our time, but that we stay more focused on just learning, you know, learning more about the truth from your word that we know is true, that we don't have to, we don't have to question your words because your word is truth, dear Lord, and that we can, we can have a ready mind to receive your words and use your words to challenge everything else that we receive, dear God, as the standard, as, the, as what is true. And it's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.